Hello, selamat pagi bagi pihak kami di Astro Awani Link. Kami mengucapkan selamat datang kepada anda. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Welcome to Astro Awani Link. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are here to learn about something new and something amazing today. And we hope that we'll be able to deliver this for you. Now, to ensure that you're going to have a brilliant webinar experience, kindly pay attention to the following video. Welcome to Astro Awani Link's brand new webinar platform designed to enhance your experience. A couple of hygiene points. We recommend that you shut down other video and audio tabs to clear up your bandwidth for a better experience. Should you experience any technical difficulties such as lag or interruptions, please click on the red reconnect button. If there is a major glitch that is experienced by a majority of the people in the room, we may reset the entire system. To sit back and relax, you will be taken to a new room automatically. If you have a question you would like to ask the speakers, kindly mark your remark as a question. And finally, we would appreciate it if you could tell us what you think of your webinar experience. Do give us a five-star rating if you like the session and write to us via the contact us form on our website. Right, okay, so that's the webinar hygiene points and now you are well and truly prepped to enjoy a good webinar experience with us here at Astro Awani Link. So without further ado, allow me to introduce myself and the topic that we'll be having today. My name is Said Faradino Omar, or you can call me Dino for short. And today we'll be talking about a subject that is, you know, hot um, in the news, everybody's talking about it. Whilst we are going to be talking about education, not exactly touching on PDPR, but we are talking about graduates and what they will go through when they enter the working world. Our webinar today is entitled Crash Course on Disruption. Is the current curricular system prepping students for the next normal work life? So that's what we'll be touching on today. And I've got a fantastic panel of um, speakers, uh, experts that will be sharing their opinion, uh, their thoughts, as well as some hopefully some very important and useful tips for you. So without further ado, so these are the speakers we've got lined up for you today. Right, okay, so those are the speakers that we have for you. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to be talking about a crash course on disruption. And this, the reason is very simple. As we are plowing our way through COVID-19, now this is, a, the pandemic has been something of a game changer for a lot of us. Um, 2020 has been a year that has been completely wrought uh, in disruption and um, the only thing that is certain is that nothing is certain. The level of uncertainty, the level of uh, new adaptation that is needed by both students as well as companies has reached unprecedented levels. People are trying to figure out what to do at the workplace and imagine the situation for a lot of the our younger friends, uh, fresh grads that will be entering into the workforce where we, um, the working adults, um, previously entering the work market, entered it with a sense of stability, knowing exactly what is to be expected of us and knowing exactly how to deliver that for our younger friends who are graduating now, who's graduating, who graduated last year and who, who is graduating, uh, who are graduating this year, they will be entering the marketplace, the work marketplace, A, not knowing exactly what's going to be expected of them because expectations have changed and be not being entirely sure of how to de deliver it uh, because delivery methods, consumption methods have changed. So these are some of the things that we'll be taking into consideration today. So now I'd like to invite my fellow speakers to please turn on your cameras as well as uh, your microphone so we can get this conversation on the road. 
uh, once again, we have uh, Professor Dato Dr. Muhammad Shata Sabran uh, of MQA. We've got Faiz Diki, who is very well known uh, social media um, influencer and an entrepreneur. We've got Mr. Gavin Baxter, who is the Director of People and Workplace Human Capital of Astro and uh, representing um, education institutions. We have Dr. Azmi Zarina Taha, the Senior Lecturer, the De uh, Department of Business Policy and Strategy, Faculty of Business, University Malaya. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Welcome on board. We've only got Dato that's um, we've waiting for Dato to turn on his camera as well as his microphone. So once again, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Now let's start this conversation with a couple of very interesting. Well, on the, on one hand we can look at it as interesting. On the other hand, we can look at it as worrying uh, figures. So according to a, uh, a report um, on the mismatch uh, in the labor market that was published um, recently, in the year 2020, there were about 300 to 350 uh, fresh graduates that will be entering into the labor market. Now, this is an increase from about 307,000 the year before and 299,000 in the year before that. Now. The thing that we need to consider that is that over the last four years, the employability rate has remained at about 96%, 96.1 to 96.0. Uh, uh, and that is positive if you look at it from a historical point of view. But as we enter the age of pandemic, uh, where uh, the last year and a half has been laced by COVID-19, we are expecting this number to change as small companies are freezing employment and um, what is required at the workplace has completely changed as well. So I'm going to start this session by asking a blanket question for each and every one of you. Um, if you could be so kind as to define what next normal at the workplace is for you. Um, looking at my screen, we've got Dr. Azni on the left and then we've got Pro, um, Dato and then we've got Faiz and then Gavin. So I'm going to go with that, uh, uh, that flow. So if you could start with uh, Dr. Azni. Uh, what is the definition of next normal work life for you? Uh, very good morning and assalamualaikum to everybody. Um, for me, as a lecturer, um, everything has been online for the past year. So uh, having to speak like this is uh, very, very normal for me already. Um, as for uh, the university, uh, you know, we are... So far, quite blessed. We have a lot of support system. We have all the IT infrastructure and everything. So um, I think on our side, this is a very normal for us. And for new lecturers, uh, I think uh, we have a lot of training on how to do online classes. So uh, in that sense, it shouldn't be too bad for a new lecturer. Lah, huh? So in other words, the next normal for you is already normal. It's already normal, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky you that you adapted very, very quickly. Uh, yeah. For Dato, what, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Dino. Okay, I think I have been in the academic uh, education industry for, for about like 25 years. Of course, you know, when I came back, I finished my study in 1999. Uh, things were different as what you said. And now it's totally different because nobody in this world you know, is, is expecting you know, this pandemic coming uh, to the world uh, early last year. So, of course, when we are talking what is the new norms, things like that, I mean, I'm talking on the behalf of the quality thing. Of course, for me, all this basic education will never change. You know, whatever year that you are talking about, the basic education is always the same, giving information, skill to the graduate or to the students. But the thing that needs to be, you know, like the thing differently is, you know, the supplement or the additional thing that you have to go beyond academia. I call it beyond academia. So something that you may get from the classroom or you may not get from the classroom. And that is the thing that we need to supply or to expose to the kid nowadays. You know, like sharing things that you are, you know, like, like myself, I, I, my my field is in leadership and community development. Sharing anything related to leadership and community development is nothing. The theory is the same, but the implementation of leadership is different. The implementation of Community development is different. How to engage with leaders? How to engage with the community people? They are different. Those are the new things that we need to expose. Now COVID is coming and we hope COVID is not going to be here forever. But those additional things that we need to supply. And the additional thing is so dynamic. 
There is no such thing as one size fits all, and that thing we need to discuss during this uh, webinar. Interesting, Tato. So you've mentioned implementation, and this is the exact angle that I wanna I, I wanna go at it with you because I wanna understand your powers to enable. So we will talk about that uh, in a bit later. But now uh, let me move on to Faiz. Faiz Diki, thank you so much for joining us. So next normal for you. Um, as it is, what you're doing right now is already not, you know, in a traditional sense of the word, a normal thing because you're mm -hmm. a social media influencer, but also mm -hmm. you run a company. So right. how, how would you define next normal from your perspective? All right. Um, as for my case, um, so basically I'm a social media influencer and that happens to be part of my job as well. Right. When we talk about entrepreneurship and how it evolves uh, as time goes on and everything. Right. I noticed that back then it's normal for us to have like a business proper business as you like have um, tangible product that you can touch and everything. But now we are moving towards the digital world. Everything is done online. When we talk about advertising now, uh, it's no longer the same TV ads and everything. Instead, you use all these social media platforms to promote your product. So this is what I'm doing right now. I'm giving platform uh, to these uh, other entrepreneurs, other businesses to sort of like come and uh, venture the world of entrepreneurship through the digital platform. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Thank you, Faiz. Uh, and last but definitely not least, Gavin, um, straight up, uh, next normal for you. Um, we both work in a company that is highly evolving and trying to stay on top of the very, very fast moving uh, shifts in consumption patterns. So can we even define what normal is anymore? Um, good question. I think, um, well, first of all, I think if I look at Astro and I look at some of the other companies, um, we're an essential service, so we have approximately 30% of our staff in the office. I don't see it changing dramatically after a uh, COVID situation gets better. Um, I still think we will operate from home. Um, I think as um, Faiz said as well, uh, what COVID has shown to us is that if you have a digital presence, if you have a digital platform, you can, you can thrive as well. So as you said, we're looking into shifting our patterns. We know in, uh, consumer consumption is changing. Um, and I think we're only starting to see what that norm would look like. Um, I think from an employer perspective, though, I'll, I, I imagine employers will start to reduce their, their property portfolio so that they will adapt to more staff working from home. OK, so let's let's talk about this working from home environment to begin with. Um, now, imagine you are a Fresh grad. Let's let's go back in time for for most of us over here. So you know, back in the day when we first graduated and we're going into um, the workplace for uh, for the first time, we are yes, we are like a vessel full of ideas, wanting to change the world and all that. But once we get into the workplace, um, you know, reality hits us, and then we learn on the job how to manage those expectations how to deliver what is expected of us by looking at the people around us, by looking at the status quo and understanding what works and what doesn't, and then trying to inject those ideas into those status quos and trying to deliver more and excel. Now, this is all easily done if you are, let's say, in an office or in a work environment where you are able to see how other people work, how our seniors work. But now, as more and more people are working from home, what is the benchmark? What are the learning points? Who do you look to um, to, to, to understand how to deliver your job well? Let's start with Gavin first. Okay. Um, first of all, I think... Uh, it's important to when graduates come into the workforce to have a structured program for them. So, for example, at Astro, we put them on a rotation program where they move across different business units. Um, they're assigned a buddy. Now, translating that from a office environment into an online environment isn't isn't easy. Um, it is possible, and again, it's through systems like this and, and other sort of community-based collaboration systems where you can try and build that type of um, uh, rapport and, and to give give graduates guidance. But um, it, is, it is gonna be hard to do. And I think um, when, we when we're looking at the type of graduates we need, I think we need to assess 
um, if, if their aptitude to see if they can adapt to that environment as well. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, uh, Doctor? Uh, for me, I think um, for a lecturer, uh, we do a lot of recruitment process anyway, and there's a lot of training that we give to the new lecturers. Uh, even tomorrow itself, I'm going to do some training for the staff. Uh, I think most universities already have uh, staff trainings that is, uh, especially for UM, we have the EDEC, uh, where they focus specifically on staff trainings. And I think for the newer lecturers, if they were to start, um, they usually work with a team. Uh, we have uh, the whole department or sometimes the HOD will assign some mentor uh, for that uh, particular lecturer and they will work together. So in that sense, uh, we can still do that virtually, as I was saying before. Uh, I think the provision of uh, platforms is critical for any new employee. If you have uh, the right infrastructure, uh, then the training will come, uh, you know, they will be able to adapt a bit faster. Um, I, I, I want to stick with you uh, for a while, um, uh, Doctor. And Faiz, I need you to, um, you know, chime in uh, on this one as well. So let me give you an example, right? So this is the crudest but simplest example that I could think of. When I was doing my diploma way back then, uh, 20 years or so, uh, or so ago in Academy TV Tiga, at that time. Um, one of the subjects is single camera production and you would learn many different things, you know, the skills and all that. Um, but one of the things that I remember until now is uh, our lecturer at that time, uh, Cik Tojo, he told us, okay, so this is how you wind the cable after you've used the XLR cable or whatever cable that you're using, right? So there's a method to it. And that was his method in teaching us. But I remember what he said to me was that, now, this is my method and I think it works well. But when you go into your workplace, you have to look at what other people are doing and try to see if that method works or not for you. And if you feel that this method works, for, works better, then try to softly introduce that into your new workplace. Now, these sorts of messages, are they still relevant in the current work, uh, in the current education system? Do you still say these kind of things to your student now, because knowing that when they graduate tomorrow, they might not be in an office. They might not be able to look at um, other colleagues and see how they do work. They are given a set of tasks, deliver, full stop. How does uh, that work? I think in UM, uh, most of our assignments are very critical thinking, I think. Uh, we do say that, especially in management like, and leadership, there's no one way of doing things. Uh, what we are giving them is just options. These are some of the ways to do it. Then you have to intuitively figure out how to match uh, which method to use in which environment, uh, especially in strategic management. You know, there's no formula. It's not like finance, one plus one equal two. Uh, you know, in management, one plus one can be infinity and beyond. Uh, it is basically up to the students. That's why uh, in the sense of uh, the way the content, like Dato was saying just now, the content has not changed uh, very much. Uh, the delivery is the only thing. Uh, what we are focusing in uh, now in classes is how do we get the students to be confident enough to talk the way we are talking right now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think that's the biggest thing. And if we can create a safe environment where we allow them to express themselves, and uh, so that level of comfort and trust towards uh, technology uh, and feeling confident online will translate later when they're working because this is the new norm. Uh, I, I'll be very honest, if it was a year ago you asked me to do a webinar, I would be very... Um, <laughs> I won't, I'll not do it, but uh, because of a year exposure of doing online classes, uh, it has become quite comfortable for me in, in some sense. So yeah. that's what I'm trying to say. If you allow the right environment for the students, uh, be it virtual or non-virtual, I think they will be able to adapt when they go out there. I hope so.
Right, right. Yeah. I mean, cameras just do things to people that are sometimes un unexplainable. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's like a TV camera or your computer camera or sometimes True. even a phone camera. The moment you say, let's take a picture, you behave in a way that you would never behave <laughs> right. otherwise. Right? And yeah. it's recorded, okay? <laughs> so, so, on that note, what is... Yes. Now, your job requires you to be in front of the camera full stop all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, is this something that you are instilling also on your other teammates, in your staff as well? Uh, yes, correct. Um, for me, I believe, uh, just to touch a little bit on what Dr. said just now, all right, the conventional way of teaching or working is not going to be absolutely useless, but it needs to be uh, upgraded in a way. So, um, I was a student uh, of communication. I studied mass communication uh, again 12, 10, 12 years ago. So back then, we had this subject called interpersonal skill, where it teaches you how to interact with other people, mainly face to face, right? That skill is still important right now, but moving towards this new normal, I think another um, sort of like, uh, uh, knowledge that you need to implement to the students is how to be comfortable talking in front of the camera because as someone who you know faces camera almost every day all right it's a totally different feeling because i used to teach as well i used to be a lecturer uh, before this uh, but being in front of the students where you get feedback you bounce out your energy to them you ask questions it's totally different even right now when I'm talking to you guys, it's silent in my ears. So it's very, very awkward, right? So um, if I were to pick a team, of course, yes, I want them to be interpersonally, uh, you know, they have they have their interpersonal skill to, to mingle with people and so on. But at the same time, they need to know how to uh, be able to cope with all these cameras, all these technologies, because uh, if you're not or not, not these things, uh, they, they 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 are required especially moving towards this uh, new normal so to speak uh, yeah you know so you're saying that the interpersonal skills um the skill set that you picked up during your university days is still relevant and still true uh, right now so this brings me back to Dato. so it, it goes it chimes in very well with what Dato was saying earlier that you know the content doesn't change is a delivery that that changes but you know i'm going to play devil's advocate here and i'm going to challenge that notion and say but the content does change what what we are expecting um what, what is expected to be taught to the students now needs to adapt to new ways of working all right so let me give you an example so where in university or uh, in colleges uh, you are thought to be working uh, in groups and you try to deliver the uh, a, a positive outcome by working in a group and you um, this is where you are supposed to be interacting and all that but now working in groups whilst it is still um, uh, possible to do so electronically the dynamics have changed the level of expectations have also changed Therefore, the content itself needs to uh, uh, evolve and adopt accordingly as well. What do you think about that, Nato? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good answer from Faiz and also Doctor. Of course, I have to support it. This is my junior, so <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, anyway, so back to the one that I said earlier. I said there is no such thing as one size fits all. And also, I did say, you know, the, the, the principle, the basic things never change. Okay, I'll give you one example, you know. Okay, let's say we are talking about uh, values. So let's say the, the culture of trust. Okay, the trust, the, the, touch, uh, the, the, uh, the, the culture of trust each other. Okay, that's the basic thing, you know. The theory of trust is there, you know, how you understand the trust that you can take the, from the religious perspective, from the society perspective. They're all talking about trust. To implement is different. In the old days, when we were talking about face-to-face, -face, when we can touch each other, when we can see the smile of each other, whatever, the smell, everything. So we can talk, you know, in order to have a trust, we have to do this according to the theory. It's like this and like that. Because we got a chance to talk to people and we can see the reaction in you know, all those people, whether they can really, really understand or not. But now COVID's coming and we and I, I, mean, I do not know exactly how do you feel because you're far away from for me and you might act you know in front of my in, in front of the camera you might smile at me but behind the camera you might say something bad about me i didn't know so how are we going to do it but still we are talking about the culture of trust 
So that's why I said the implementations must be different. Uh, the implementation must be changed. That's why now the challenge is among the lecturers, for example, among the educators, are they there enough to go beyond the conventional way? I give you an example. In, let's say I want to inject the value of caring among my students. Of course, I can talk about the theory of caring, blah, 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 for the entire day, but those people understand. I don't know, I'm not really sure, but they did say in front of my class. But the other way, I would go beyond the conventional way. So I said, okay, you have two days. Two days, today's Monday. You, I want you to come back on Wednesday when we meet uh, this class. So during this two days, I want you to go to any old, old, uh, old houseboat. And I want you to spend like a couple hours or like a day with them. And then after that, you come back and report to me what yeah, have you done there. So of course, I want you to try to highlight the, uh, you know, the, the element of caring when you were there. I can bet everybody the feeling that you have when you were there on the ground together with those people and the one that you are sitting in front of is totally different. So it's different. So the same thing, you know, COVID or not COVID is just like a, a media, it's just like a scenario. They come and go. And of course, we cannot so stop with COVID until we forgot the whole thing. So we need to go beyond COVID. Or now it's COVID. Uh, if what happened after COVID and things like that? For me, it's all subjective, but it's just a matter of coming back to us. Are we willing to go beyond conventional? Are we willing to try new things? But the most important thing, I don't think we need to change the basic thing of education. Uh, in this case, the culture of caring. In this case, the culture of trust. It must be there, but how you inject that value to the case or to the student will be depending on the scenario and the situation. Maybe it's good in London, but in Malaysia, it's not good to do that way. So it depends. We have to uh, alert in the other environment. Hmm. Now, and uh, what role does qualifications play now in, in today's working environment? Um, is it still the be all and end all? Um, does it matter more that you are, you know, specifically qualified for a certain job? Um, because again, it boils down to the fact that now the notion of learning on the job is reduced because you are, you know, facing a situation where you will have limited interest direction and uh, you're, you are also having limited exposure to the possibilities available to you at the workplace. So, okay, you know, qualifications, Dato. Okay, you know, this is the thing. I think this one we need to understand. The society need to understand. When I was a kid and you're still young, when I was like, like a 20 is something the most important thing the most important to get a job is your academic qualification if you had a degree you got a diploma you are hired if you have the and then goes back uh, goes up a little bit if you have a degree with cgpa three point something something you are hired that was so history now if i ask faiz faiz will agree with me let's say faiz i give you two 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 students okay number one student he got 4.0 4.5 even better <laughs> and the other one just 3.0 or 2.9 so you call for the interview and you ask a very simple question five five i say okay you see this yes i see mr five can you explain the thing that i'm holding now in three minutes the 4.5 kit uh i only see a bottle of water <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other three, two point nine. Thank you, Mr. Feist. You know what? Yes, this is a bottle of water. You know what? The water is coming from from the ground. They were like extract water from this. The, the company who make the bottles like this, they were using the recycled thing. This is a very good for them. From blah blah blah. A five minute, ten minute anti Thank you very much. You are hired. True, correct. Those are the things that we need to understand. So the problem now, where are you going to get the skill of explaining all this? This one, the 4.0, no problem. I can give you 4.5. I can, can even give you 6.0. But can you be so out? Can you be like a taken by the companies? The question must be a big question mark. This one, this one. So in order to train you to be able to speak, in order to train you to able to, to, to explain, to work in group, and that is beyond academic, beyond self. That's why now we are encouraging all the universities, all the institutions, uh, higher learning, don't go, don't, don't be too stuck to the syllabus only. You need to go beyond that because you need to prepare the kid for the future environment of working because of course we cannot come up with the right formula. These are the things, uh, the job in 2050. No, that will be impossible for us to do. But what we can do is injecting the additional skill and values like what I said. And of course, in this country, we categorize those under the name of soft skill or kemahiran insania.
Yeah, understood, understood. So that's very valid. Um, but that also brings into play the question of the shifting of paradigms. Uh, the, 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 the crux, or rather the, the, the different matrix uh, one places on both actual essential skills and additional softer skills. You know, we want to talk about that. Uh, but before that, I just want to remind everybody that we've got a chat room, um, attendees, we want to hear from you. Do send in your questions. We will either be taking the questions as we go along, which is what I'm going to do exactly right now, or we might also pick up some of those questions at the end of the session. Um, this session will run until 12 o'clock. So do send in your questions. If you have any specific questions about skills and stuff like that, do send it on. So now, um, going to uh, 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 Gavin, there, there is a question um, that is asked here um, yep. uh, by uh, one of our attendees. The question is, what is the new comp uh, competency skills uh, needed needed by the young fresh grads? What is the industry's expectation towards this new normal from the young fresh grads? So this is something that ties in very nicely with what Datuk was saying. We want to understand the additional stuff as well. What are your thoughts yeah, on sure. this? Well, I think, first of all, uh, I completely agree. And it's very encouraging to hear Datuk uh, talk about how uh, academia is uh, approaching this. Um, couldn't, could not agree any more than this. You know, I've seen graduates at career fairs who uh, have got the perfect the perfect um, scores, the perfect CV, um, but they just can't communicate, they can't interact. And um, you're exactly right. We go for the other person describing the water bottle. Um, I think as far as uh, the competencies needed, it, I think first of all, there's a technology benchmark that, that the uh, graduates need. Um, however, I think because they, they come from a digital native environment, that's, that's sort of instilled in them. You know, if I look at my kids, uh, my eldest is 13 years old. All of his informal learning is YouTube. If it's from fixing his bike to working out how to, you know, a recipe for, for something he's cooking with his mum, it's all on YouTube. So I think there's that inherent inherentness around uh, technology. Um, and I think that that leads into uh, sort of social media as well. I think social media and, and the presence that people can have can really show uh, how they can network, how they can build uh, relationships and how they can interact. Um, I'd agree with, with what you said, Dina, and what uh, Datuk said. I mean, either uh, life skills or interpersonal skills or soft skills, there's still going to be that, that real supplemental part to, um, uh, to, to getting a, a really good job um, because as we all know in interviews, you have, you know, opinions are made within the first 30 seconds. Um, and that's still true today. And I think as people go through that interview process, um, be it in an online environment, which again is, is more challenging, they need to be able to show uh, some of that broader skills uh, where they look at um, how to adapt to questions, um, how, they can, how they can show their own experience um, and how they can bring in um, uh, the work that they've done at university or through internships as well. Uh, I want to stick with you for uh, for a bit, Gary. So, uh, Gavin. Um, so, uh, you mentioned uh, the the uh, the notion of the opinion being created within the first thirty seconds. So, what we are saying is that um, as you enter um, the job interview, for example, um, what you can do on paper what you're qualified to do is a given and that remains to be tested. And that is something that you have to prove when you are on the job. Um, now, when you are trying to get your foot into the door, uh, it is about the impression that you are going to be creating. Now, we all know that communication skills is super important and that is probably one of your key winning cards, your trump cards. Uh, what other things do you look out for? I have a follow-up question to that, which is one of the um, common questions asked during interviews is, tell us about yourself. Now, this is where a lot of people get, get it you know, terribly wrong and they start talking about, you know, they are infatuated with Pokemon for you know, all of five minutes, for example. Yeah. Um, but how do we go around this? All this in the interest of creating the right impression. Yeah, sure. So anyone can write a CV with any information on it. Um, I could write down my top 10 competencies, but unless they're evidence-based, um, it, it, means, it means nothing. So I think uh, when, when I've interviewed graduates, um, I mean, really, the experience comes down to the internship. That's, that's really where you can gain what they've done. 
And it's them being able to educate what they actually did more than say, I've got communication skills, I've got networking skills. It, it's a lot It's a lot broader than that. Um, I think the biggest the, the sort of the, the one skill that surrounds all of this, and it, come, it goes back into emotional intelligence, it is just self-awareness. It is self-awareness. Uh, we're all humans. We all do things really well. And occasionally we do things bad as well. And I think it's having interviewing people that don't come in as as robots that are just saying everything they've done in life has ended up really well you know i don't think people can learn from 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 that situation i don't think people can build resilience um, and i think the key skill out of all of that is is having a degree of self-awareness where things have gone wrong um where you've where you've looked back and reflected and said i could have done something different at this time you know, they could be in charge of the student union. They could be in charge of, of a uh, faculty, a, you know, student faculty. And they're not going to be able to manage that 100% of the time in, in the right way. So just being a bit more self-aware um, can really help. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Faiz uh, in a bit. Uh, I'm going to ask Faiz to talk a little bit about what Dato was saying just now about, you know, uh, and Gavin was saying just now about, um, uh, you know, your social media presence and how this can either make or break you. So I want I want to hear some of the tips uh, from you and what you have observed in, uh, in, in, in your time as an entrepreneur, but also as a social media influencer. Uh, I do apologize to everybody if you're hearing some ruffling. I live in a house with six cats. I think you can see one of them trying to enter the frame just over there but this is the new normal this is the new normal of working from home and you have to do with all this but before that i want to go to um uh, to doctor um so all these things that has been mentioned by dato has been mentioned by gavin you know the soft skills the additional stuff that will not appear in your cgpa how are universities preparing students for this um uh, for the business school, we have uh, interviews before they can enter. So uh, I think recruitment for our school is very important because when you're in the business school, uh, there's a lot of talking involved. Uh, so most of the time, uh, we don't only look for the matriculation uh, CGPA. We also look into their proficiency in speaking. So therefore, uh, one hurdle has already been uh overcome through the interviews. Um, furthermore, for the undergrads, if you're talking about the undergrads, uh, every week we have presentations. And now because of uh, COVID-19, they have to do online presentations. And our undergrad also have uh, students from other countries. So you see those students actually have the opportunity to virtually test working in an international context. Nice. So. That's really uh, what I think quite, was quite valuable for our students because we have students from China uh, and Middle East and they have to coordinate their work assignments together uh, and do the presentation together. So in that sense, uh, you know, uh, I think it does enable our students to, you know, be a global worker now, if you ask me. Uh, that's one positive. Um, another thing is, uh, you know, the presentations, we do it uh, quite a lot, yeah, in our, uh, and discussions. Um, for the undergrads, we designate tutorials, so they have to talk uh, and present during the tutorials. So, um, I don't know about the other schools, though, uh, but for business schools, we... That's, that's what you do in the business schools. <laughs> yeah. So, com so, communication and presentation skills and, and speaking it's... skills, so that's something that you, you push out there. Uh, we are also running a poll. Uh, and I want to uh, I want to talk about this poll a little bit with uh, Doctor. Uh, the current question that we're asking is: Do you think our current higher education system is ready to equip the graduates for the future? Now, the results are currently standing at almost sixty percent are saying no, they are not. Uh, what are your comments on this? I also want to ask Dato to comment on this as well. Okay, from a micro perspective, from one university. Um... I think it depends on uh, which program are you relating to. Uh, the more why? why why does it depend on programs? Uh, because if you are more theoretical in some sense, some subjects are more theoretical. Uh, some subjects are more technical. So if you're on the technical side, then yes, uh, we do 
on the job almost like accounting you see them going out there immediately you can do the job but for management uh, there's still a lot of on the job experiences that are required leadership you know you can learn certain leadership quality uh, in the class uh, maybe in uh, the co-curriculum but on the job leadership skills uh, still has to be developed sometimes comes through experience so uh, it really really depends on which subject so if you're a, a engineering or is it tvet or something like that then yes you immediately when you go out boom you can do the job but other things like uh, business uh, management marketing yeah uh, you can learn principles of marketing you can try and sell a few things but when you go and meet real clients uh, you know the <coughs> dynamics of you know how people are in the industry uh, the aggressiveness you don't really see that aggression in the workplace uh, you know in the industry the private sector uh, as opposed mm. to in class yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Very quickly, let's, let, let's jump to that that your thoughts on that they're saying they're, not, they're saying that universities are not doing enough uh, to prepare thank the students you. this way. Thank you. Thank you. I, I like the question, you know, but I'm going to ask you this question. Okay, if we ask, uh, we ask asking the same same question without changing a single word, but I'm going to ask. I will go to LMC. If, if we were going to ask the same question back in early 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. At that time, the job market were like crazy. Hired, hired, hired. That was the name. So when you ask that question to the student at that time, do you think the system of education ready? I can bet 99.99% say yes because yes. of the environment. Now it's COVID. People is firing and firing, firing. And you no, ask. Wait, wait, hold on. Hold on. Wait, 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 no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I'm going to ask This is the scenario. So my point is. You also need to understand the environment before you ask questions. Okay, coming back, I'm, okay, I'm going to support also what the doctor was said. Okay, I said my stand still the same. You know, there is nothing wrong with the content of the education. Okay, but the thing that we need to understand is how much that I go beyond academia, how much that I know how to solve the problem, how much that I know how to deal with the problem. So now, if the professor, if the lecturer ask the student using this problem-based learning, for example, okay, I'm teaching a leadership theory, or well, I just say, okay, next week we are going to discuss about few theory of leadership. Can you find the information and discuss with me next week? How many of the students will say, yes, professor, I like your style. That's the way how you teach me to learn. Or the student will say, you are so damn lazy, professor. You just makan gaji buta. You asked us to do everything. You didn't do anything. <laughs> you understand. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Lato. But I'm, I'm going to challenge you a little bit over there. You see, okay, so again, I'm going to take a logic. That's quite true. I'm going I'm to take a logic and, and, and say, okay, let's go back to 2003. And they will probably say, yes, universities are preparing ourselves. But then that's probably because, and I'm again playing the role of devil's advocate over here. It's probably because... You know, all those skills, the additional skills that was mentioned by Gavin, that was mentioned by yourself and uh, Doctor, as well as Faiz, uh, about communication, about, you know, litigation, all that, those skills we picked up not necessarily from the formal education that we received. It was from our interaction with our peers, the networking and the, the core co-working uh, that we needed to do. So those were skills that you picked up along the way allowing universities and education institutions to focus on the formal learning process. So this is probably why they will say, yes, universities are preparing us enough because they are giving us the formal education that we need. Everything else that is needed for the job, we do on the side. Maybe that's, th this is the case. I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Disagree, disagree, disagree with you. <laughs> I still... Hold on, hold on. Hold on. And if you, okay. So uh, I'm sure there are students and uh, educators uh, in the audience right now. So this is what you need to do. If you think that you are supposed to be learning the soft skills from your peers, hit one and enter in the chat room. So I want to see what people are saying. If you feel that it is the responsibility of universities to teach the soft skills and the additional skills, hit two in the chat room and, uh, and answer one. Uh, from your peers to from uh, the university formal education. So go to the chat room and put one or two and uh, enter your comment. Okay, back to you, Dato. 
Okay, I give one example. I don't want to. Okay, I have one kid. My kid was doing mass com at one of the universities in this country. First semester, okay. First semester, you know what she was? She was being asked by the lecturer. Okay, I want you to a documentary about three communities in this country, and I want you to record and I want you to explain. So that was the instruction. Nothing. So of course, as a father, you know, I said, "What are you doing? Oh, daddy, we have to go to find a shop. We have had to rent a camera. We have to go to. What did your professor say? No, they just asked us to do it. Nothing. Zero. So they have to learn by themselves how to operate, how to run everything. And then finally, I saw the the the, the product. Daddy, can you see your product? And I saw, and I was so surprised. The quality of the product just like a Discovery Channel. So when they presented. In front of the lecturer, and the lecturer will teach you. Okay, this is the way how you do things. So, so they are learning by problem based learning. Did they complain? Of course, the kid will complain. But I said them, okay, you just follow and listen and do the instruct what they will be instructed to. And I'm sure you can learn something. So when she was going past that thing, she went up to the second semester, third semester, and then she went abroad. So when over there, she got no problem at all because she was being exposed and she being taught. So when you are talking about oh, it's nothing to do with the uh, education. Actually, that was the education that make her to interact with other people and other community. So. It's all coming from the original point: education system that being created by the government of Malaysia. <laughs> uh, the, the answer, the answer to uh, the the question, uh, the question I asked earlier. Um, I see a lot of people agreeing with the fact that um, the education, the softer skills, needs to come formally from universities. So that's because most people are uh, choosing two. So that I'm sorry, this is one score to me and none to you uh, for no, now. But... <laughs> no, it's a discussion. You have to create discussion so that the problem. Of course. Yeah. Of course but yeah. Can I, Gavin, just, have... can I just add yeah. one, on. one quick thing? Um, sure. to, be, uh, to be honest, when you talk about communication skills and interpersonal skills, uh, some of it is innate. Uh, that means it's uh, in the person. So if you do not, if you expect education system to transform somebody from zero to hero, I think you are asking for a miracle, lah. Uh. Oh, I agree. Oh, I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, all I'm saying is, uh, us as academics, we we try our very best to provide uh, as much exposure as we possibly can. Uh, and you will see some students who will have a very high motivation. They will really fly and they go above and beyond. Uh, but there will always be the case of some students that will, uh, you know, not because it's not within their personality. Sure, so, um, all I'm saying is, you know, uh, yes, we do our very best. But uh, again, uh, there's no one size fit all kind of thingy to lump it all onto the higher true, education. True. Uh, to transform, um, we can, but not to from zero to hero lah. No, I completely agree with you, yeah. Doctor. I, I was just, like I said, I was just, you know, enjoying the role of yes. the devil's advocate again oh, uh, there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah, uh, Gavin, uh, you want to chime in there? Um, no, I'd agree. I think obviously parents have a have a big role to play in uh, their, their their child's development, um, and I think with universities, you know, one of the key factors is is employability. So they, they would be measured on the success of employability. Um, and I've seen universities in the UK that offer quite a substantial curriculum based on what we would define now as uh, soft skills. I think they call it character development. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in, in an online world, that, that become, you know, I'm, I imagine that university is rethinking its, its sort of operating model as well. Um, and I think industry have a role to play as well. So... Mm. I don't think industry should just sit there and, and wait for these these perfect graduates to be popped out of the machine. I mean, that's just not the reality. Um, and again, what I can see industry doing, I think, first of all, is 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 more stronger partnerships with universities, uh, particularly around internships. Um, like what Astro does is um, is have the rotation program as well. And with that rotation program, the expectations on the graduates are slightly less because they are spending three to four months moving around different divisions and learning, uh, effectively being a sponge. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, uh, we want to get back to that. It's important to us. We are hiring graduates this year. They're very important to us. Um, so I think, you know, hopefully, although I can't talk on behalf of all of industry, I'd hope that uh, there's similar fit people thinking the same as as both myself and my organisation out there. So, the, uh, Gavin, the approach to new hires here, 
are different when it comes to fresh graduates versus employing people for specific roles who are probably already established in whatever area that they are in. Yes. For fresh graduates, you give them the benefit of doubt, you give them the benefit of experience and experiencing the various departments until they find a fit that suits them. Is that right? Yes, correct. So, so I think it's what we call experienced hires, are where we effectively match someone's skills and experience to a particular role. Um, for graduates, yes, we, we don't take a we don't take a a, um, uh, a punt, so to speak. We actually put them through an assessment as well before we hire them, um, relevant to our industry where they have to provide their their views and their inputs. And then there is some interviews as well. But yes, as they move around that business, um, they're, they're supported. They can ask questions um, with a view of them being uh, more rounded as a result of that experience. What we don't do, and what, what I, which I actually disagree with as well, is this um, fast track management scheme that we see mm. quite often in the business. I actually think we're sometimes, you know, in a lot of the cases, we're setting up people to fail um, because they they come in as a as a fresh graduate, and then they're expected to be promoted in an accelerated time frame um, ahead of someone else, whereas they haven't had those years of experience. experience Again, yeah. going back to how do you build resilience through failing? Um, it doesn't have to be dramatic failing, but by, by failing and learning from that and building. And as, as both Datuk and the doctor said, you know, leadership, is, leadership isn't a book. Um, well, it is. It's a thousand books in any bookshop you go to. Um, it's, it's what it means uh, to that organization. You know, being a leader at Astro is different to being leader at Patronus. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's some core skills that, that make that the same. Um, and I think when, when, when organizations create uh, these management trainee programs or fast track leadership programs, um, I think unless they're very well supported and structured, um, it's probably not the best approach. And it's not something uh, I advocate at, at Astro. Either. Gavin, I find what you're saying very interesting because a lot of companies in this age of pandemic um, are hiring free, um, uh, 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 freezing hiring. Yep. Um, and they're not taking any new people. And if they do, it is because there are specific roles that need to be filled. And these are essential roles yep. that, that needs, you know, experience and, and, and all that. Uh, I want to bring your attention to this um, report uh, that was published last year uh, by the Institute of Student Employers. Uh, the report is entitled COVID-19 Global Impacts on Graduate Recruitment. And as I look at the executive summary, one thing strikes me um, from what you were saying earlier, which is the graduate market mirrors problems in the wider economy, whilst graduates often escape the worst uh, impacts of recession. The size and health of the graduate labor market is tied up with a wider economy and that uh, the graduate recruitment volumes are down everywhere. So there is a possible mismatch in what the graduates want and can do versus what employers are offering in the market right now. Uh, how would you like to comment on that? Um, look, I think from our perspective, and I hope this applies across the board, um, you have to invest in, in future talent. You have to invest in young people. Um, yes, we are conservative on, on other types of recruitment at the moment. Um, but to go back to what um, Faiz said around um, being an entrepreneur and being on a digital platform, again, bringing in fresh people uh, who are smart people with digital nativeness in their blood is something that all organisations want. What organisations in the industry have got to see, they've got to play the long game. They've got to say, OK, I can, I can get... This is the type of people I need uh, in our business, and I can see them really making a, a strong contribution in a couple of years' time. Mm. Um, because the digital, the digital age is is it, we're almost past it, you know. And um, we need we, you know, I I'm a digital dinosaur. I am not a digital digital native. So for me, trying to work out how to use social media uh, into some of our into some of our products and services, um, I'm not going to do a great job on. Um, mm -hmm. where, whereas others will as well. So I think if, if um, I think there's unique qualities that graduates can offer. Um, and I think organizations need to need to see the long term benefit of that. Understood. Right. OK, so um, now that you've mentioned social media, so I'm going to I'm going to go to um, uh, to our Fahis, to Fahis, um and, and I want to ask him um, something that that was um, on my mind uh, since 
early on in this uh, discussion, um, which is about projection of social media. But before that, um, mm -hmm. again, I want to go to the attendees and I, want, I, I, I would like to ask you to do me a favor and answer me this. And, you know, panelists, please feel free to answer this as well by saying one or two. Now, in the, um, when you are entering the job market, uh, and in uh, when you are considering the work that you're going to do, which do you think is more important immediately right now? Is it personality, hit one, or skills, hit two? So answer me that uh, in the comment section. Uh, very quickly, <laughs> Yavin Faiz, Dato, and Doctor. One for personality, skills for two. Which is it? No well, long answer, just one or I'm, two. I'm going to be greedy and say... Or one and two. Yeah, I see, I see. <laughs> me too. <laughs> all of you, all of you are copping out. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. That, that can't. That can't be the case. No, no. It's one has yeah. to be more important than the other at this point in time. So you know, I'm just wondering. Okay, uh, a lot of people that. are saying two. Two. Gavin. Uh, one. One personality. Um, no, I said both are important. I cannot compromise. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a, you can't you can't do that. If you put one on me, I'm not going to say one. <laughs> my, my theory is, my theory is, if you if you if one is very strong, you can pick up two. If personality is strong, you can pick up skills. Okay. So when when you're saying skills, I don't see skills as uh, necessarily the the type of degree you have. So it's a broader definition of skills. Broader definition, yeah. correct. Do doctor, one or two? Two. Uh... Skills are more important. <laughs> Personality is something you can build along the way. Uh, I think okay. I, that's why I think Dato says both because it still no, depends on which out. degree. <laughs> depends on which degree you can't. Uh, okay, okay. I'll I'll accept that. Yes. Okay. I think okay. Let's just be fair. If it's sciences, then of course, yeah. If social sciences, then personality. Mm. I think so. If you, uh, it depends on what is the job requirement. If the job requirements require a lot of interpersonal skills, then yes, of course. Right, 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 right. One, one of our attendees, um, uh, this person's name is L, has summed it up quite nicely. Having skills with bad personality will ruin oneself. You're dead. That's quite true. And good personality is important that may lead to improve the skills. So again, L, you are still popping out because you're saying both one and two, but I understand what you're trying to say. Talking about personality, now, mm -hmm. this is where I want Faiz to come in and really share with us your amazing skills because you've got more than half a million followers on social media. So you must be projecting something right. Now, social mm -hmm. media is a finicky thing now because as you're applying for a job, um, I know if people are going to be asking me for a job, I'm probably curious to know what kind of person this person is. And one of the easiest way for me to find that out is to look at their social media. Yeah, so sure. social media, A, do you think for you, Faiz, this is a make or break, uh, make or break kind of a deal breaker thingy? Or and, and two, how would you like to uh, say these are the, uh, the essential tips you would like to impart on people on projecting the right social media image? All right. uh, we uh, cognizant of the time. We are now at eleven fifty-eight, so we're supposed to have only two minutes left. But mm -hmm. I think we'll extend this to about twelve or five. We've got some questions coming in as well. Go ahead, Faiz. All right. I think it's very interesting because whenever people see social media, they always think that it's just you know stupid people doing funny videos and everything. But they don't realize that it takes a lot of effort, a lot of knowledge to create and produce a content. So in my case, I believe that to be successful in social media, in the digital world, you have to have these three things. First, you have to have knowledge, you have to have interpersonal skill, as well as the third one, you have to have the knowledge of digital in you. So you have to combine all this to make sure that whatever that you produce on social media, is not just entertaining, it has to have substance as well. You don't want to be known as that person who is famous by doing nothing. All right. Because this will relate back to how you are in real life. For example, social media is your personal or your, your alter ego, right? But it relates back to your normal daily life. If you're applying for a job, if your employer and employer were to actually go through your social media and to see all these posts that are irrelevant, about you, they will have this kind of like sort of a negative um, uh, notion about you, mm -hmm. right? That is where uh, 
knowledge comes in, you know, the things that you've learned in school, right? For my case, I've, I've, you know, I was a journalist before, so I'm quite equipped with the knowledge of the media. So um, I was a mass comm student. I, I studied advertising. So I picked up all these little, you know, skills and knowledge and apply it to my social media platform as well as my business platform. Mm -hmm. So if I were to sort of like give an advice to, you know, those people who are watching out there, one thing that people always take for granted is your digital heritage or digital breadcrumbs, you know, what you've been posting all this while. You have to remember that, you know, social media, it's open. People can trace back whatever things you've posted years ago. So moving forward into this new world where, you know, uh, employer actually monitor the, you know, the staff, social account, uh, social media accounts and so on. You have to be Chok, aware. Chok, Faiz, Faiz, Chok. Gavin, is that true? Do, do employers monitor staff social media accounts? No, no. Uh, we, well, we, we certainly don't. Uh, obviously, we use a lot of hashtags for our business as well, the same as, same as any others. And we just monitor through that, but only in, yeah. only in a positive sense. All right. Um, right. Okay. So it's not the personal stuff. No, but I agree. You, 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 when you bring social media into a corporate environment, the, the rules change. Right. Because right. okay. the, 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 the lives, your life doesn't become corporate and personal on social media. It blends across. Right, right, right. Faiz, going back to they, you. They, they may not monitor per se, as in like literally monitoring your social media, but whenever that you've done, it's going viral, right? So, they have to take a peek on what is going on with your social media presence and so on. So, one one tip that I, I would like to share to other people is be knowledgeable on what you share on social media as well. Mm. Because, because moving forward, this is something that, you know, it, it coincides with our daily life. So, you cannot put those things away, two separate things away. Yeah. Mm. So, in other words, the reverse way of saying that is don't do anything stupid, stupid. on social media. <laughs> correct, because correct. Because they will haunt you. Right? <laughs> Forever. <Okay>. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Recent, recent, um, recent, um, uh, recent news has shown that, you know, what you do on social media can have a huge impact on, on your life, uh, right. including your it's work life. Um, it's called President Trump. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, all right, guys. So we've got about three minutes left, and we've got a lot of questions coming in. And I, I didn't even have time to look at the questions, so I've asked my team to select some questions, and they're going to flash the questions up now, and we will take them as we go along. So, um, uh, my team at Link, uh, Amy, if you could just flash the first question up, uh, that would be brilliant. Um, we will try to answer some of the questions that were sent in. Uh, we did try to answer some of them uh, early on. Okay, so the first one is from Mazura. The education system is good preparing the graduates for the working world. The learning will never be 100% mapped to what the industry wants. Do you think that lifelong continuous learning should continue at the workplace with the support of the employer? It is the time for industry to be involved, involved in uh, teaching and learning in universities. Uh, I know for a fact that in Astro, uh, learning is a, a huge part of our experience as an employee. Uh, it is actually required of us um, to do so. Correct, uh, Gavin? Absolutely. Um, I think it should continue in the workplace. I think it should continue in the home. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had one staff on who couldn't do much during COVID, um, who was working from home and, and taught herself uh, how to code um, because how the resources, oh, yeah, do Python and because the resources are there, so. But I think right. I think employers should absolutely um, support it. Yeah. Nice one. Le learning how to code. Um, I, I I took the time to learn how to speak, read, and write Thai. That's not quite the same as coding, but <laughs> it's something else. Uh, 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 Doctor, uh, do you see universities playing a role in creating a relationship with um, uh, with uh, companies in enabling this, you know, lifelong learning to happen? Oh, definitely. Uh, nowadays in uh, UM, uh, one of the new imperatives by the new VC is that we have to have an industry speaker for uh, almost every uh, course that is available. So at least one week, uh, we should invite an industry speaker. So that will give an industrial perspective on that particular subject. 
Right, right, right. So the so, relationships are created yes, that way yes, with yes. the uh, with the companies. Okay, uh, time for one more question. Um, uh, my team at Link, uh, let's flash it up right now. If you have it ready already, we've got about one minute or so left uh, to go. Okay, here we go. Uh, from Kenneth Cock. Uh, hi, panelists. Allow me to ask this question, which puzzled me for a very long time. So important question. Why all university students need to learn courses which are not related to Industrial Revolution 4.0, such as philosophy and appreciation of ethics? Uh, Dr. and Dato can take this. Okay, uh, let me start. Oh, okay, sorry. Dato, go ahead, please. Dato, Dato, please. Yeah. Okay, so just a very uh, simple question. I mean, answers. Okay, the basic education that we have now is just like a key to open the door. You can open the door, but you cannot enter the room. In order to enter the room, you need the additional things like skills, languages, things like that. So that's why the one that we're talking about, R4.0, 5.0, 6 is all the basic thing, just equivalent to the key. But you not just simply need the key. You need to go inside the room. So in order to get inside the room, you need to learn all the soft part of the education that you may get from the classroom or you may get from the industry or you may get from the society. Mm, okay. And your and your comment, uh, the, uh, doctor? For me, basically this, uh, why do you have to learn ethics? Is because uh, you have to understand the repercussions of uh, what the technology does to the society. I think that's very important. Because if you learn just the skills and you don't understand what is going to happen to the society, uh, not advisable. Uh. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, it's not just about, you know, the, the, the core learning subjects, right? It, no. it revolves back down to that. It's always good to learn all this. So once again, uh, panelists, that's all the time that we have right now. Uh, if I could just ask you for one last favor which is to, um, if you are okay with it, to put um, perhaps your email address um, in the chat box if you are open to receiving questions uh, from our panelists, because uh, from our attendees, because I think a lot of people are asking um, uh, more questions. And if you want to direct them specifically to our panelists, um, if I could ask our panelists to put their email addresses in the chat room, if you are okay with it. Now, one caveat, please do not email Gavin asking for jobs. That's not how it works. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and do that. So once again, to, um, to uh, Dr. Azni, to Dato, uh, to Faiz, and to Gavin, thank Thank you so much for your time. It's been an amazing session. Um, we've learned so much. Um, uh, there are points that uh, we've bantered on, uh, which I think um, will get a lot of us thinking about how we go about doing things in the future uh, as we go into um, uh, our workspaces and also how we see uh, our younger colleagues and some of the things that they have to put up with. So those are the things that we'll be thinking about. Um, if you have enjoyed, attendees, if you've enjoyed the session, uh, do rate as five stars because again, it goes back down to um, uh, perception, right? And and how you want to project. So if we, we want to project the idea that uh, we are uh, helping the community to learn more. So if you like the session, uh, support us by giving us five stars at the end of the session and we will be coming back with more uh, relevant topics for you to participate in. Uh, Dr. Dato Faiz and Gavin, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank uh, you very we much. hope to be having you guys again soon. My name is Said Fredino. Thank you, Omar. Thank you everybody. Yeah, and, thank we, you. and we hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. Take care for now. Bye bye.